My daughter and I have owned and operated a busy quilt shop in Washington State for over 20 years. We have a retreat center, an active YouTube channel, and a large pattern line featuring our creations. My two sons work on machines. One daughter-in-law is our videographer and the other is a long-arm quilter. We are a family that love each other, we laugh together, and every once in a while we get some work done. We have a crew that are saints for their efforts at keeping us on track. Thanks for joining us on our wild ride. Hi, my name is Cindy Rang with the Fabric Patch in Efreda, Washington, and we're gonna talk about binding. So I did a previous YouTube video probably four or five years ago about binding. It was just the basic binding. You can still find it. It's still relevant. It's still a great way to do binding. But today we're going to talk about five different methods. There's lots of ways to be able to finish your quilt. You can do the basic binding, adding some colors, or just do a few different techniques. So a couple of just quick tips before we get started, and I've mentioned this in previous classes before, but whenever you've made a quilt, it's always important to kind of decide your binding at the same time. Otherwise, it might take you some time to piece the quilt, even a little bit longer to quilt it. And then if you take this piece into the quilt shop to try to find something that will match, it's very possible that all of the fabric is gone. So I always select my binding at the same time I'm putting together my pieces for my top. It might just be a little chunk, but I make sure it's always with that top. The other thing is I might have even made it to the opportunity of making the binding. That's still okay. Just prepare your binding, leave it with that top until you have a minute to go ahead and get that binding on. But I think that's really important. Fabric changes a lot in the quilt shops and you just wanna make sure you always have something that will match. So basic binding, it looks like this. Um, there's a couple different ways and we're going to review the basic binding where you're going to stitch it on, prepare it, stitch it on, flip it over. You might hand stitch it or you can machine stitch it. I'm gonna show you both. There's a specific way to be able to do your corners. It's important to be able to know how to do good binding. You might be making bags or um, this is my retreat tote. It has this nice little binding edge on it. This one also happens to have the elastic binding on it. So it's important to be able to know how to do that binding. Even if you're not prepared to make a quilt or you haven't made a quilt yet, you might find that there's something else that you want to make that requires a lot of binding. Some of the different color opportunities that you can do is you can use up leftover pieces if you have something that's fairly colorful or something that needs a little bit more pizzazz, your binding doesn't have to be all one color. You can go ahead and mix up multiple strips and have a mixed binding. That's kind of a really cool effect. The other thing that you can do is you can do a decorative stitch on your binding. Not only a decorative stitch, but maybe even a decorative thread. One that I like, and I'm gonna show you a fun little math to do, is this little piped binding. This is one of my favorites. It just adds a tiny little pop of color, a really cool effect, and it's not true piping, it's a faux piped border. And two other things that I'm gonna show you that I think are a little bit unique. One is a self-mitered binding. And so there is one where you can just bring the whole thing over, bind the whole thing down, but you can take it one step farther and that binding can actually become a border. And the last one is we're gonna talk about a decorative little fused binding that's kind of a fun technique. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so the first one that we're gonna do is the flip and stitch. And this is sort of old fashioned. Um, I'm gonna show you on smaller projects just so that we can get them done in real time. But with a quilt, you can take your, your quilt top, put it right sides together with your quilt back and your batting, sew around, turn it inside out and top stitch or stitch it closed. I'm gonna show you how to do that on a small piece, but let me just show you for just a second what I mean. So this is, this is a really good example. So I made this tiny little mug rug and then I have the backing, which in this case is kind of a fun little label piece. I put them right sides together, stitched all the way around, turned it inside out, 
and then I top stitched. This is one that I haven't yet done the top stitching and you can see the reason for that is because you can see where I've turned it right side out. So what will happen is I'll tuck all of that in, do a little top stitching all the way around. You can still go ahead and do your machine quilting, anything else that you want to do on the inside. And then there's just essentially no binding. We've just turned it right side out and we've top stitched. Here's another one. This was just a cute little piece of fabric with an applique heart. Fun little piece on the back. These are two different pieces though. So all the way around right sides together, turn it right sides out. And the reason that we top stitch around the edge is because it just gives kind of a nice crisp finished look. All of these are just little mug rugs. It's an easy way to do mug rugs. It's an especially easy way if you have something that is shaped funny. So if you're going to do some seasonal mug rugs and you have something that's obviously heart shaped or star shaped or pumpkin shaped, egg shaped, it works really, really well. You can also do them if you have a border. It's not any different. So if you've made a little block for maybe some little ornaments and you've put a little border on it, same thing, right sides together on top of your backing, turn it right side out and you can just stitch it closed. And in this case, I just stitched in the ditch right around here just to kind of give it that nice little finished look. So we have a couple of those. One last one to look at, same idea. Quick little border around a little embroidery stitched pot holder, right sides together, stitched around, turned it right side out. And then this one again, it was just hand stitched closed. So this is my little sample that I'm gonna show you. So this one is going to be a pot holder. So this is my little block. This is a fun thing just to practice on if you've made a couple of blocks for a quilt or for a wall hanging and you've decided that you're not going to finish the quilt. It's fun just to go ahead and finish your blocks in some little mug rugs or pot holders. So what I have is this is my quilt front, essentially. This is my quilt back and here's my batting. So I've got my batting, my quilt back and I've got right sides together. And I'm just going to go ahead and make this a little bit bigger because then I'm going to trim it after I'm done. So I'm going to do a sew all the way around. But since this is going to be a pot holder, I do want kind of a little hang tag for it. So all I've done is I've taken a little piece and I have pressed to this so that I've pressed it in the center and I've brought these two pieces in. Just made kind of a tiny little binding. So I'm going to top sew this really quick just so I can make a little hang tag. I always make a tag longer than it needs to be so I can select where I want it and how long I want it to be. Probably a little bit longer than they need to be. And then you have to decide where you want it. I kind of like them in the corner. If you notice this seam here, this seam on the outside of this block is nothing. I just always like to finish a block with just a little bit of stay stitching so nothing comes undone. Okay, then you want to decide where you're going to turn something right side out. If it's a quilt, we usually kind of tend to pick down around the bottom somewhere just so that it's not extremely visible. Pot holder, same idea. But if there's something extremely visible that you know people are going to look at, you just don't want to draw attention to it. So I just usually pick the lower bottom and that's what I'm gonna do this time too. So I'm just gonna start here. So when you start, I usually will um, just do a little bit of back stitching. The reason that you want to do that is obviously you're going to put just a little bit of stress on it when you are turning it right side out. So you just want to make sure that your stitches are fine. There's little bits of paper only because of what um, this was. So ignore all of that. I've got my quarter inch foot on, which has my little blade. I'm going to sew all the way around. When you get up, if you are making a pot holder, when you get up to where this is, is holding it, I go over this a couple times just because you know there's going to be a little bit of stress on that. 
And you never want your turning to be at a corner because when you're hand stitching or top stitching with your corner, um, you just don't want to have to deal with that. So I always come off of the corner a little bit. And then again, you just want to back stitch. And that's it. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this over and I'm going to go ahead and trim off all of my excess. The reason that I always make sure that there's extra is that if you look at this, look at how there's less here than there was there, even though you kind of feel like you lined everything up. So it just gives you an opportunity in case something is shifting while you're sewing it. Um, so I tend to never have my backing, my batting, and my top all the same size. Your other option, if you do want to do that, is just make sure that you pin it. If you pin it really well, it's not going to slide, but for something that tends to be kind of small, I don't pin it very much. I'm going to trim this and we'll be right back. Okay, so I've trimmed all of this around. You can see both sides. And I've not left a huge gap to turn it and um, that will happen sometimes uh, is on a quilt obviously you're going to have to have at least 10 inches to be able to turn something through to get everything through but for a pot holder or a mug rug the space doesn't need to be very big so um, the other thing that you can do on your corners is you can blunt them just a little bit the reason that that's helpful is then that'll give you a nice crisp point when we turn it right side out all right, I'm going to turn it right side out and then I'll show you how to finish it. All right, so this is our little pot holder, little kitty pot holder. So I've turned it right side out. I gave it a tiny little press, but you can see it. So then what happens is if we look down here, what will happen, this is where we've turned it right side out. So I'm just going to fold all of this in and fold the back in. And then I can just take my needle and thread and do a quick little whip stitch and stitch this closed. But your other option is to hold this together so you can see how much there is on each side. And you can see that that's why what I choose to do is just top stitch extremely closely all the way around. And then that way where I've turned it, you can't even tell because you don't have to see my hand stitching. You only see that top stitching and then again it gives that nice kind of finished crisp little edge for your mug rug or your quilt or your table runner, whatever you'd like to do. So this is the flip and stitch method. It's really no binding at all but everything is fully finished. Okay, so I'm going to show you how to do a self-binding back. So every once in a while, you'll have a project where either you've hand quilted it or you've tied it or you've machine sewn it or whatever, and your back is not only big enough, but it's also the exact right color to be able to be the binding. So the first thing you're going to do is you want to make sure that you've cut off all of the excess batting. And I just do that with a pair of scissors. And you just have to be really careful to make sure you're not cutting through everything else, but cut your batting even with your quilt top. Just run that along and up oh, and cut that on, on all four sides. And then after you do that, you're going to go ahead and measure and cut this out. And I'm going to show you this also in the next step when we talk about the, um, mitered corners, but I personally like about an extra inch all the way around. So I actually use my ruler, cut all of this off to make sure that I have an inch extra of my backing all the way around to be the binding. Because then what you end up doing is you end up folding it, and maybe I'll let you get in here kind of close. Okay, so again, this is just a one inch. So when I fold that in half, that's about a half an inch. And when you fold it over, you have this nice half inch binding. So I'm just gonna fold that over, put my little binder clips on for a second. But what I really wanna show you is how to do the corner. Because what'll happen is if you've got this folded, 
and you're just going to go ahead and fold this over and fold this over. If you look at that, it just is, I mean, I guess it's not horrible. It just seems a little bit clunky to me. And there's a whole lot of fabric right there. So what I do instead is I'm just going to bring this over. So that one's folded. I'm going to go ahead and bring that down at that 45 degree angle and then fold everything in and then fold everything over and then you have, sorry. <laughs> if you press this, if you do this at the ironing board, uh, it'll be a little bit neater. But so then it looks like that. So then you have this nice little folded miter edge and it's kind of nice. So then what you're going to do, and I, again, I clip it, clip everything to hold everything down. And you can either come in with your sewing machine and top sew right there, do a decorative stitch right there, or you can hand sew it. But I'm going to go ahead and show you, oops, you would tuck that down. But I'm going to show you how to do how to cut this so that you have an actual sewn miter. Because if you feel like that's a little bit too bulky, I'm gonna show you an option for that. All right, the next one I'm gonna show you is this self-mitering one. It's kind of a cool trick, but what you can do with it is um, when you have your backing here, you just bring your backing over and it creates this fun little miter. And then you just top stitch everything down. You can top stitch it down as a decorative stitch um, or just a straight stitch. So I'm gonna show you first on this one and then we're gonna go ahead and do it with this one. So what you do is you take your backing, you fold it in, you cut off this corner, you end up with what we call goal posts you flip these goal posts over. We're going to stitch, stitch, do a funny little clip. And then what happens looks like that. And it will automatically fold in, fold in on itself. And then you can just top stitch it down. So the back becomes the binding and even can become a border. There's a whole nother technique where it's the same thing, where if you're in this particular case, if you're starting with a four inch corner or center, four inch center, eight inch batting, 16 inch backing, you would end up with this backing that becomes a border and you're just gonna stitch everything down. Um, so this is another fun technique. We're actually be watching for a video. We're going to show you how to make a baby quilt this way. That's kind of fun. All right, so let me show you how you do it. So here's my little square. So this whole thing was machine quilted and you can see that I've already just taken scissors and I've trimmed off the batting. So the batting is all trimmed off and this is my leftover backing. So all I'm gonna do is I'm going to decide how much I want. So if I cut off two inches, then by the time I fold that over, I've got one inch left and I'm gonna fold it over again, which is gonna be a fairly wide binding, like something like this one or something like this one. What I'm gonna do instead, I kind of like one inch. It just seems to be the right size for me. So I'm gonna line up my ruler. I've got my line here so that I know that I'm exactly an inch off. So I'm going to trim this whole thing up. All right, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to fold this in and I'm going to go ahead and press it. Again, this is a fairly small binding. You'll see it's going to look about like that. You can adjust this based on what size you want your binding to be. So I'm going to go ahead and fold this all the way over, all the way around, and I'm going to go to the iron and press that down. I'll be right back. So I have pressed these in. You can see that I've left just a little bit of space in between, and that's generally a good idea because what's gonna happen is all of this is going to fold over and you don't want everything to look sort of stressed and pulled. The same thing will be true because what's gonna happen is we're gonna cut this corner off. So you don't want to cut 
right at the corner, you actually want to come up, I don't know, about an eighth to a quarter of an inch, enough to give you just a, enough room to be able to turn it. And you'll see what I mean in a second. So I've measured out an inch, I've cut that off, folded this in and pressed it. Now I'm gonna take my ruler and I'm going to cut this off at a 45 degree angle. So you'll have that marking on your ruler. You're gonna lay that down and I'm going to come up to about, again, about an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch past. I'm gonna show you that when I cut it. So I've lined up, I'm on 45, I'm right up through here. And I'm gonna cut that tip off. And as soon as I cut that tip off, again, it looks super weird. And if it looks like goal posts, you've done it exactly right. Because what's going to happen is I'm going to spin this around. And that's why you need just that about quarter of an inch extra. I'll show you that in a second. Okay, so here we are at the sewing machine. What we're going to do is we're gonna take each corner, fold this over, right sides together. And again, the reason that we have left just about a quarter of an inch here is because I'm going to sew down to right where that, that crease is from pressing, and then I'm gonna sew off the end. You'll stop with your needle in the down position. And then after you've sewn that, we do just clip that corner. And when you clip that corner, you don't want to cut into what you've sewn. And then what will happen is this whole thing will flip around and the whole thing will tuck in. And that's what creates that little miter. We'll press it and I'll show you. I'm going to go ahead and sew the others first and then we'll come back to the rest of that. So I've got all of them done, all four of the corners. So now all I'm going to do is just to go over. I like to sew with a stiletto. That's what helps me to make sure that all of those little bits feed through underneath the foot at an even rate. But when you go to turn things out, some people will use a stiletto, but I like to use a purple thing. It's also known as a turning tool because what will happen is it's a little bit blunter and so it's not going to poke through anything and it'll help you to get that corner all the way out. I'm going to tuck that in. And see, that's what it looks like. But see my little corner there? You can use your stiletto or a pin to kind of poke that corner out get a nice crisp mitered corner or from the inside if you poke out you'll go through so if you like to do it from the inside that's where I use the purple thing and it'll look like that so I'm gonna go and do this at the ironing board so I can press everything and I'll be right back okay so I've pressed it all the way around and you can see that there's this perfect mitered seam right there a little mitered binding and you can see where if I would have chosen a different backing instead of what was on my border, I could have kind of a really cool backing binding, but I just chose the exact same one. So now all I'm gonna do is I'm just going, you could hand sew this, but by machine, I'm just gonna stay fairly close to the edge 
and I'm just going to sew this down all the way around, just making sure that everything stays nice and straight. You'll want to pay attention to the color of thread that you use because obviously your thread color will be seen. I'm going to go ahead and stick with this same white because it's the same color that I used to do all of the quilting in it. And it might seem that I am stitching this backwards and I very well could be. I am dyslexic, but this is an easy, oops, this is an easy way for me to make sure that my binding is exactly the same width all the way around. So if I am working on a pot holder or a mug rug, I tend to lay it up this way. Obviously when I'm working on a quilt, um, I might not want to fold everything in here, so I will do it the opposite way. So if this seems backwards, it, it very well could be. Okay, that's it. I'm going to give it one quick little last minute press, and then we're done. So here you have it. From the back, you can see that there's the little stitching line. That's what you're seeing from the front. So after you folded this over, here's your nice little miter. Here's your little stitch, and it's just all the way around. Nice little mitered corners, and that is your magic mitered bindings. So this one is the magic mitered borders. So again, it's done exactly the same way. It's just that this backing is brought over not just enough for binding, but in fact enough for a border. So there's all kinds of little math that you can play with, but I'm going to tell you if you want to do a really simple one, um, this is a four inch center, an eight inch piece of batting, and a 16 inch piece of backing. So you're going to do it exactly the same way. You're going to bring this in, leaving yourself about a quarter of an inch gap, bring it in all the way around and press it all the way around. Then once you've done that, you're going to do that same thing. Oops. You're going to do that same thing and you're going to cut this at a 45 degree angle. So you have your funny little gold posts and then you'll do exactly the same thing. You're going to bring this and you're going to sew your little gold posts and clip that and it's going to magically, that seam will be there, It'll magically come over and then when it comes over and you stitch down, you are also stitching down your little center block here. So that's how you have this cute little focus. We are doing this as a separate class and we're going to show you how to make a cool little baby quilt doing this so that the minky back and the minky border are the same. So you can watch for that video coming up. Okay, I'm going to show you just traditional binding. And this is binding where we've started with a strip and we've sewn it onto one side, we miter the corners and then we flip it around and we can either hand sew or machine sew it to the other side. So I just want to mention for one second, there are a couple of different tools. This is a really nice card, it's five bucks and it's just a perfect binding card. So it has the basic um, method that I'm gonna show you in terms of how to put binding on. And on the back, it has some math. So it talks about continuous binding, how to make bias binding. So there's a bunch of little steps in here. We are not going to do bias binding for this particular project because it's not necessary. Um, we do have another video though about bias binding. Okay, so first of all, what you're gonna do is you're gonna start with your strips. And I tend to do a two and a half inch strip. It's the size that I like. Some people will tell you to use two and a quarter. It's no rule, it's whatever you like. Some people like a tiny little binding. I just find that two and a half means that I don't have to mess with it at all because I like to machine sew my binding down. If you are truly going to hand sew it down, those are the people that like the two and a quarter inch. Okay, so we have a bunch of strips, however many you feel like you're going to need for your project. You would just do the math knowing that you've got approximately 40 inches in a strip. So if you have a quilt that's 60 by 60, you're going to need a minimum of six strips, but remember that you have to sew them together and you need 
um, extra for the corners. So I would probably start with seven strips. All right, so whatever your binding, your length is, when you sew them together, you do want to do this diagonal seam. The reason you want to do a diagonal seam on binding is because you want to make sure that all of that bulk is not in one area. So if you sew them together straight across like this, by the time you folded it a couple of times, you're going to have quite a nasty little lump right there. So that's why we tend to do a diagonal seam. And the way that you do that is you're just going to lay out your strip so that you've got right sides together, one on top of the other. And then you're going to give yourself about a quarter of an inch on this side and a quarter of an inch across the top. And then draw a line from one corner to the other corner. Oops. And using an appropriate marking utensil, <clears throat> you're gonna sew right on that line. The reason that we come in from the side a little bit and we don't just lay it like this is because you would end up getting this weird jagged edge. So if you look at this, I can show you better. So this is where I've laid them together. I've sewed this one on and I've trimmed off that excess right there. But see what happens? You have just that tiny little bit. That tiny little bit is necessary so that when you fold this up, you have a nice straight edge right there. So remember to offset it, draw your line, sew on that line. After you've sewn on that line, then just go ahead and measure your you know, quarter inch or whatever and cut off that excess. And that's how you sew all of your strips together. I've already done that with this one. So here's where all of my strips have been sewn together. Mm, all right, and I'm ready to go ahead and sew this on. So what's going to happen, I'm gonna do this in front of the sewing machine, but again, just like everything else, you never want to start right at a corner. And since you're gonna have a little bit of a join, I usually will put it down at the bottom. So I start in from the edge. I'm going to show you an alternative method to this one. This one is more traditional, and if you're watching other videos or if you Google different things or YouTube um, other binding techniques, this is a very common practice, as is the bias binding. I'm going to show you an alternative method. All right, I'm going to show you traditional binding with a self-closing end. So what that means is that Instead of doing an end where you fold everything over, find a little line, sew everything together, I'm going to show you an alternative. So what you're going to do is you open this up. This is the edge of my binding. And I'm going to fold this one in. And then fold this over. And I'm going to start sewing it down right here. As with everything else, we do a quarter inch seam allowance. I just changed my stitch length. You can see that stitch length is super tiny. Um, it's probably not such a big deal, but if you end up with a lot of bunching, sometimes it's because your stitches are too small. So whenever you're going through so many layers, it's a little bit nicer if you have a little larger stitch length. I'm going to sew to the end and I am within a quarter of an inch of the end. Can you see where I'm at? And I happen to know that because on my particular foot, there's a line. The line on my presser foot is right there, and here's the edge. So I'm right here at the edge. What I'm going to do is just do a little back stitch, and then I'm gonna cut my thread. And then, and I've cut my thread, removed it, Here's my little back stitching. Some people will do the same thing and they sew off on the diagonal right here. If you're an experienced sewer and you feel like you can eyeball that and you know where you're going, that's a great technique. Otherwise, I just sew to within a quarter inch, back sew, pull it off. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to fold this up at this little 45 degree angle. 
and then I'm going to fold it back on itself. So it looks like that. So again, I folded it up at a 45 degree angle. I folded it back on itself. And now I'm going to come in at a quarter of an inch. I'm going to start right there, back stitch, and continue on, and then do the next corner the exact same way. And let me show you one more thing. On your foot, see that little line right there? If that's on that edge, see it right there? I know that that line is right on the edge and my needle is right there. So I am a quarter of an inch from the edge. So I am right there where I stopped. I'm gonna do a couple stitches and then I'm gonna back stitch. And so my quarter inch seam all the way down. Again, stop within a quarter of an inch, back stitch, fold it up. See, and that's what the other one looks like. See. So this one, I'm going to do the exact same thing. Fold it up, fold it back, and start again. And don't, don't make that short. If you're doing like a 60 degree and back, you'll have a funny pull and curve in your binding. You really want to make sure that it is absolutely 45 degree and back down so that you have all of the fabric in that angle that you need. And again, I'm going to line it up with my line in the back. So I'm starting right at a quarter inch, back stitch. The reason you back stitch is because if you've ever done a binding and when you pull it out and you see these funny little stitches in here you see your threads that's why there's a little bit of tension on there and so you don't want to be pulling those stitches out so if you do a back stitch in and a back stitch out it's going to hold those stitches nice and tight right there so that you don't see any of your threads there and we'll see that closer at the end okay so i've made it to the end and this was where we had started so what's going to happen is instead of folding everything, making a crease and sewing everything together, I am just going to tuck this in there and have um, kind of a little faux connection. So remember I folded that over, which, and that created this funny little pocket in there. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to tuck something in the pocket. It just so happens I have a join there. It couldn't be in a worse place. I usually try to avoid that, but oh well, I kind of messed that up. It doesn't really matter. But what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna kind of eyeball that because I want a piece to tuck into that corner. So I'm gonna come to right here. And I'm going to cut it opposite. Oh. I think I cut that a little short, I mean a little long. Okay, so it looks like that. I'm just going to tuck that in there.
You'll be able to feel if you have a pucker in there. There we go. All right. What's going to happen when you tuck this in, you've come in just a little bit. So it's going to shift ever so slightly. It's going to shift your edge off. It doesn't matter. Just follow the edge of your quilt for your quarter inch. And then as you sew this, just sew through all of those layers until you end up where you started. I'm going to show you what that looks like. So up close, see it looks like that. And when you fold it over, that's what it looks like. Usually I'll just put a couple of little hidden stitches in there and you don't have any bulk. You have a little bit, you of course have, there's four layers of fabric there where there's two everywhere else, but you will never ever notice it. And it's just a nice, easy way to do it. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and go to the iron. I'm going to trim off all of my little starts and stops. And then when I go to the iron, I'm going to bring this over. And what you're going to do, well, hold on. Let me do some trimming. Okay. So what you're going on. Okay. So what you're going to do is from this side, this side will automatically miter. You have an automatic mitered edge right there. And it's just perfect. So this side, what you're going to do is you're going to press this over. And again, you've got your 45 degree angle and you're going to press this down and they will line up. And I'm gonna press it that way. And I'm gonna press it on the front and on the back, and then I'll be right back. All right, so I have folded everything over and I've pressed it. And so I'm ready to go ahead and stitch this down. And you can do a couple things. You can either stitch in the ditch on your sewing machine and machine sew down your binding, or you can hand sew it. Um, before we talk about that, I just want to talk for just a second about Wonder Clips. I just want to make sure you know that there's a trick with them. Um, a lot of people tell me that they don't know this. A lot of you guys already have these. These are fantastic. They work great instead of pinning. A couple things. One is that they come in um, groups of 10, 50, or 100. They're roughly about 50 cents each. Um, it's less money if you buy more of them. But I just want to say, do not buy the generic ones. Um, these are very um, snug and they'll hold quite a bit because this piece of metal that's in there is a really quality piece of metal. They're not going to break. I have seen in classes some of the generic ones and I thought, oh my gosh, why did that thing break? I've never broken one before. And then I realized that they were some inexpensive ones. It's a different brand. So you'd really do want to stick with Wonder Clips. But I also want to show you that there's a specific measurement. So let's go back to this for a second. And I told you that I start with a two and a half inch and then I fold it over. I've sewn down my quarter inch. And then as I fold this over, when I clip these, I clip them so that the end is right on that seam that I've sewn. And you can see that the top of my piece or the edge of my binding is right at that metal. You can see that every one is exactly the same way. So I've put these on because then when I flip it over, I can see very quickly that I've got about an eighth of an inch before I get to that seam, right? Because the end of this one is exactly where the end of that one is. The reason that that's pertinent is because when I stitch down my binding, I'm going to use my... Um, this is a stitch in the ditch foot. So if you happen to have a faff, it looks like this. And I'm sure that they make them for Husqvarna, Viking, um, Bernina, whatever sewing machine you sew with. You can see there's this blade that writes, runs right down the center. Um, we sell faff, so we have these for faff. I think they're maybe a $22 foot. They're not very much. But what's kind of fun, you'll see, I'm going to show you this in a second. But 
um, what will happen is when you're sewing, this will run right down the center of that and it follows that guide so that no matter what you're stitching in the ditch. So that's how I tend to sew on my binding when I flip it over because it's just so quick. Some people say they don't like that because when they flip it over, they might have sewn right on the edge and then all of a sudden they've veered off and then they've come back on. And so they have these weird little snaggle tooth edges where things are not caught. That's what these are for. Because what's happened is I can guarantee, I can look at this and I can see that I'm right where I need to be because this is right on that ditch. Does that kind of make sense? So I'm lining everything up and I can see exactly where it is. I can tell that no matter what I sew, and I'm gonna show you in a minute, I'm gonna go ahead and stitch this down and you'll see that it comes out exactly right. Your corners are a little bit different. What you wanna do on your corners is of course on the front, you've got this perfect little miter that is done because of the way that we folded it. And then on the back, you're doing it the same way. You just fold it up, fold it back down, and you just want to make sure that that comes together and you can see that we are past where we're gonna be stitching it in the ditch. And of course you don't fold uh, sew over any of your binder clips, you're taking them off as you go. So you've got your flat on the bottom and this one on the top. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this foot on and I'm going to sew my binding down. Your other option with this, with your traditional binding is to go ahead and hand sew it down. So it's whatever you prefer. All right, so I'm ready to start sewing. I do have white thread in the top, which mm, is sort of living dangerously. Um, sewing in the ditch here, I really probably should pick a dark blue, but I just want you to see what it looks like. And then again, I've checked everything. All of my binder clips are positioned exactly how they should be. And I have verified that, of course, I'm going to be sewing in the ditch and so I'm going to be able to catch every single backside here. And I do have my stitch in the ditch foot on. So all I'm going to do, since I have the stitch in the ditch foot, is I'm just making sure, let me point to this for you. So you can see that that blade is running right down the center in the ditch that's been created of where we sewed the binding onto the quilt. And it's just going to ride right in there. So as I'm sewing, when I get close to where the binder clip is, I'm just gonna pull it off. And it's just staying there. I don't really, I mean, I'm guiding it obviously, but I don't have to really do much steering because it's resting right in there. And then this one, same thing, I'm going to stitch to the corner and then leave my needle in the down position and pivot. Okay, so we'll look up close here. And you can see where I've stitched in the ditch again with white thread. You can see it if I open it up, but otherwise it's basically invisible. And now the true test going to flip it over and see everything is caught. I need to trim my stitches off, but everything is exactly where it should be. Even on the corner, even on my fold, all the way around. All right. That was where I overshot it a little, but anyway, so that's the trick to it. The trick is the binder clips and the stitch in the ditch foot. And again, if you feel like, and this works for me every single time, it works with a large quilt, a small quilt, small projects. It works perfect um, using these two components. If you feel nervous about it or you want to go ahead and hand stitch, it's easy enough just to do a little whip stitch all the way around. It's just a time issue because certainly sewing it down by machine is way faster than sewing it down by hand. Okay, I'm going to show you pi faux piped binding. This is a super cool effect. It basically goes on 
almost exactly the same as traditional binding. There's just one little trick to it. So what it looks like when you've put it on is you have just your regular binding on and you have this little faux piping. Piping is a of course, typically has just a little bit of cording in it. And this is really just some folded fabric. It gives you this tiny little edge of color that makes it kind of cool. All you do is you're still going to start with your two and a half inch binding, but whatever your piping is, whatever this fun little color is, is one and three quarters inches. You start with a one and three quarter inch strip and then your binding. So this color right here, is one and one quarter, one and a quarter, one and three quarter. Sew these together with your quarter inch seam allowance and you end up with, because you started with um, your three inches, you end up with two and a half inch binding. And then when you fold this over and you press it, see what happens? Because your piping one ends up a little bit bigger, you have this funny little piped edge that's on there. So then all you do that's different is you sew it onto the back. So you're just gonna go ahead and lay that down, sew it onto the back of your, of your project, whether it's your quilt or table runner or placemat or mug rug, flip it over to the front. And then when you sew this down, you're still going to sew it down by machine. Again, I would go ahead and grab my stitch in the ditch foot and I'm just gonna go ahead and sew right up along this edge. And when you sew up along that edge, you have this fun little piping edge. You're still gonna do the same thing as you come up to the corner. You're just gonna come up at that 45 degree angle, fold that back on itself, put your little clip in there and you're still gonna do the same thing. Sew up, pivot right there and sew all the way around. So it goes on exactly the same as traditional binding. Your only difference is the way that you prepare the binding. And again, that measurement is one and three quarter for the piped part, one and a quarter for the binding part. And that's it. Okay, the last one that I want to mention is really more of a technique and a design, not so much a type of binding. And that is to use some decorative threads and decorative stitches. So whether you are using traditional binding, if you're bringing your back over to your front, if you're doing an easy miter, whatever you'd like, the idea is just to select one of those decorative stitches that you have already in your sewing machine and select a really cool variegated thread, something that's going to show up just to give a little bit of interest to your binding. Your other option is to do something that's hand pieced. This is a very different look and it's really for somebody who is familiar with different hand embroidery stitches. So this is just a chain stitch with some pearl cotton. That's all it is. There wasn't anything different, but if you've stitched your binding down and you just feel like you either don't like it or you want a little more color or something else in there, you can just add, again, just a little bit of decorative thread. This is just pearl cotton and a chain stitch. Okay, one thing I want to mention just really briefly are the um, raw edge options. So Minky or Fleur or uh, Cuddle, um, any of these brands that you're using, when you have an, a raw edge there, it doesn't continue to fray in any way. Once you have cut the edge and you've given it a good shake, um, the nap isn't continuing to fray. So what's really nice is that if you have that as a backing and you want to bring it around as a binding, you can bring that around and just sew it right down. You don't have to worry about any kind of fold. So you don't have to fold it in and fold it over and make this big bulky binding. One fold, sew it down and you're all good. And again, you just have to decide for yourself how you want to, to do your corner. If you want to do your corner as a folded corner or as a um, goalpost mitered corner, but Minky is one of your uh, raw edge options. Fusible web is another one of those raw edge options, but unfortunately it's also, it kind of needs to be a no wash option because 
Fusible web is a, an, uh, you can use heat and bond or you can use steam a seam, uh, any of those, but uh, really it's only going to hold its place uh, for about three washings, unless you use the no sew. But so what happens is it creates this nice little sticky surface. Once you've ironed it down, it'll stay down. So what I have here is just this cute little wall hanging. This is really just um, a class that we did in color resist. It was never gonna be anything other than a mat or um, a wall hanging. And so it has this fun little fusible batting. This is just a bookmark. And so it was really just a fun technique with some tool and we practiced with the metallic thread with this tiny little item. And so again, if we just wanna put an edge on it, all you have to do is put your fusible web on the back side on the wrong side of your fabric. And then what's really nice is if you have a pinking blade, if you have a rotary cutter that you like and you maybe have an extra one, the pinking blade is, I don't know, I think they're like maybe eight or $9. They're way cheaper than a pair of pinking scissors, which is like 35 or $40. And then all you have to do is go ahead and line this up and it'll just cut right alongside your ruler. And so you have this, oh, mine is starting to get a little dull, however, but you have this nice, cool little pinked edge and you can do that on both sides. And then after you peel this off, here it is, all you have to do is put this on, bring this over and just iron that down. You can go ahead, if you want it to be permanent, uh, you can go ahead and sew it down and it's okay, but there is a possibility you'll have a little bit of a raw edge applique look on it. So anyway, just one of those options that I just thought I would mention in case you have kind of a little quick project and you don't wanna go through all of the labor of binding. Thank you for watching our video. We invite you to leave a comment, hit the like button, or better yet, subscribe to our channel so you never miss an episode. You can also visit our Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, or Pinterest pages, or find all of those things and our online store at fabricpatch.net.